I saw a woman dying on the street outside Campbell Hospital. I picked her up and took her to the hospital, but she refused admission because she was poor. That day, she died on the street. I knew then that I must make a home for the dying, a resting place for people going to heaven. Mother Teresa. If you want to be a real human being, you cannot tolerate things which put you in indignation to outrage. You must stand up. Stefan Hessel. Stefan Hessel, a concentration camp survivor and a member of the French resistance, stood up against the Nazi regime of the 1930s and 40s. His little book titled, Time for Outrage, sold more than four million copies in its day. He once said, look around, look at what makes you unhappy, what makes you furious, and then engage yourself in some action, in some action. If there's a time If there's a time to be quiet and still, you can hear the whisper, the low whisper of God to direct you in your life message. Then there's also a time to be aware of and frustrated by the evils and injustice in the world around you. And we call this a holy disturbance. A holy disturbance. I ask you the question, what human injustice, community crisis, or personal pain is there that not only drives us to our knees, but also drives us to action? How many believe that faith is more than just believing? Faith is action. Amen. Involved, committed, signed up for. After all, where do you hang a light bulb but in a dark place? And where do you set up a triage but in a place of trauma? We need, his church needs a divine disturbance that prompts us to action and drives us out of our comfort zones and propels us into the place where God is calling Our life, to be very obvious, our life message to echo God's deliverant deliverant power. Understand, our greatest message is often birthed out of our greatest misery. And our greatest proclamation is often birthed out of our deepest pain. And our greatest kingdom dialogue is often birthed out of our own personal disturbance. I could ask a question this morning, and you, you could answer it a lot of different ways, but I wonder how many in the house is disturbed. It's a scary thought. What is it that keeps you up at night? What is it that nags at your spirit? What is it that convicts your spirit? It says a cloud over your head. For the greater the injustice, the greater the injustice, the greater the indignation. And the greater the indignation, the greater the involvement. That kick in the proverbial gut is often the wake-up call for I need to get involved. And see, that's the issue with the modern-day church today. We have churches that are full of attendees, but fewer people that are involved in ministry. And I just want you to know, God appreciates your faithfulness and your attendance in the house of God, and he appreciates your support of the local church, his kingdom with your tithe and offerings. He appreciates that, but that is not all that there is in you abandoning all and following Christ. That's only the beginning 
That's only the first chapter in a life dedicated to the cause of the kingdom. Hillsong sings a song that says it well. Heal my heart and make it clean. Open up my eyes to the things unseen. Show me how to love like you have loved me. And then it says, break my heart for what breaks yours. For everything I am for your kingdom cause as I walk from nothing to eternity. Show me how to love like you've loved me and break my heart for what breaks yours. When you look at Mother Teresa and she is a an amazing public person, an amazing kingdom person. But do you realize she wasn't always known as mother? In 1943, famine struck the Bengal province in India. British estimates suggest that as many as 4 million people starved to death. Four million people. A few years later, in 18, or 1946, Muslim violence broke out in Calcutta. Thousands more were brutally killed and died. A nun at the Loretto Convent in Calcutta, who was then known as merely Sister Teresa, witnessed the misery, those catastrophic things brought to the people of the city, and her heart ached for them. And she prayed often about how to respond, but had no clear clear direction. But one day, while on a train, returning from from a weekend of spiritual retreat, she felt a strong leading that she should leave the covenant where she had been working and ministered to the poor of the city as one of them, begging for her own substance while loving the people of the slum. That's radical. Nothing about her prior experience would have indicated a personal source of physical or emotional pain that might have made her sensitive to poverty. There was nothing in her past to drive her toward hunger as a motivating issue. She was simply filled with sudden compassion and a certainty that God wanted her to help. Today... We refer to her as Mother Teresa because that's what she became to the poor and the powerless of Calcutta, a mother, a mother. Notice what it said in the article. There was nothing in her past to drive her toward hunger as a motivating issue. She was simply filled with sudden compassion and a certainty that God wanted her to help. She was once heard saying, listen to this, the poor are Jesus in disguise. The poor are Jesus in disguise. And then Jesus comes along in Matthew's gospel, the 25th chapter, and he makes statements like this, for I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you to drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick and in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, truly I say to you, As you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it unto me. You did it unto me. And he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you cursed into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was hungry, or I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me naked, and you did not clothe me sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. And they also will answer saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? And then he will answer them saying, truly I say to you, as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. That's his words. 
That's in red. That's the gospel. Mother Teresa was driven by a holy disturbance that forever marked and motivated her life. Her heartfelt compassion became her driving passion. We see that over time, Mother Teresa, because she was willing to be disturbed by what she saw about her, she founded the Missionaries of Charity a Roman Catholic religious congregation which in 2012 consisted of over 4,500 sisters and is active in 133 countries. They run hospices and homes for the people with HIV and AIDS, leprosy and tuberculosis, soup kitchens, dispensaries and mobile clinics, children and family counseling programs, orphanages and schools, a Nobel Peace Prize winner. That's Mother Teresa. And it all started on a train coming back from a spiritual retreat. And God stirring within her a desire to make a difference, a holy disturbance. David was driven by such a desire, such a disturbance in his own life. And I want you to take your Bibles and turn to some very familiar passages of Scripture found in 1 Samuel chapter 17. And I want us to read this old, old story again. And allow the Spirit of God to speak it deep into our hearts and minds today. 1 Samuel chapter 17, David is just a young man, a shepherd, living at home, the youngest of many sons in his father's house. The Bible says, now the Philistines gathered their armies together to battle and were gathered at Sokoth, which belongs to Judah. And they encamped between Sokoth and Ezekah and Ephsdamon. And Saul, the men of Israel, were gathered together, and they encamped in the valley of Elah and drew up in battle array against the Philistines. And the Philistines stood on a mountain on one side, and Israel stood on a mountain on the other side with a valley between them. And a champion went out from the camp of the Philistines named Goliath from Gath whose height was six cubits in a span. He had a bronze helmet on his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze. He had bronze armor on his legs and a bronze javelin between his shoulders. Now the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his iron spearhead weighed 600 shekels, and the shield bearer went before him. Then he stood and cried out to the armies of Israel and said to them, Why have you come out to line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine and you, the servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourselves and let him come down to me. If he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. And the Philistines said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. And that is still the challenge in our day and hour in which we live. Give me a man or a woman or a teenager that we may fight together. It's time we armed ourselves for the battle of the kingdom and declared ourselves as a part of the armies of God. And Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine. They were dismayed and greatly afraid, cowered in fear. Now David was the son of an Ephronite, the Bethlehem Judah, whose name was Jesse, who, who had eight sons. This man was old, advanced in years in the days of Saul. Pick it up in verse 17. Then Jesse said to his son David, Take now for your brothers an ephah of this dried grain and these ten loaves and run to your brothers at the camp. And carry these ten cheeses to the captain of the thousands. And see how your brothers fare and bring back news of them. Now Saul and they and all the men of Israel in the valley of Elah fighting with the Philistines. Really they were just paused. 
Verse 20, so David rose early in the morning, left the sheep with a keeper, and took the things and went as Jesse had commanded him. And he came to the camp as the army was going out to fight and shouting for the battle. For Israel and the Philistines had drawn up in battle array, army against army. And David left his supplies in the hand of the supply keeper, ran to the army, and came and greeted his brothers. As he talked with them, there was the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, coming up from the armies of the Philistines, and he spoke according to the same words, so David heard them. David heard them, and all the men of Israel, when they saw him, fled from him and were dreadfully afraid. So the men of Israel said, Have you seen this man who has come up? Surely he has come up to defy Israel. And it shall be that the man who kills him, the, the king will enrich with great riches and will give him his daughter and give his father's house exemption from taxes in Israel. That's almost enough reason to go to battle. Somebody, somebody shout amen. Keep the daughter, just take care of my taxes. Verse 26, Then David spoke to the men who stood by him, saying, What shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? David was getting stirred up. Come on now. Some spiritual indignation was rising up in his spirit. And the people answered him in this manner, saying, So shall it be done for the man who kills him. Now Eliab, his oldest brother, heard when he spoke to the men. And Eliab's anger was aroused against David. And he said, Why did you come down, from, come down here? And with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your pride and the insolence of your heart, for you have come down to see the battle. Friends, there's, when, when you begin to step out for the cause of the kingdom, you will always have somebody that says you can't, you shouldn't, you should stay back, you're not qualified, you're too young, you're too old, you're female, you're male. But I'm telling you, when God places his hand upon your heart, he is the one that qualifies you. He's the one that anoints you. He's the one that sends you out to battle. And he already has a plan for victory in your situation. And David said, what have I done now? Is there not a cause? Is there not a cause? I ask you the question this morning. Is there not a cause to stand up and be counted for the cause of the kingdom? For your family, for your neighbors, for your co-workers, for your community, for this world. Is there not a reason to fight for their eternal salvation? Because there is only one message that can get them through the pearly gates. And that is that Jesus Christ is the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. You can come to God by no other way and by no other means but Jesus Christ, the anointed one. Hallelujah. We have the only salvation, the only message of salvation this morning. Goliath, this giant of a man. This uncircumcised Philistine, the enemy of Israel, this bellowing bully became a holy disturbance to David and drove him to declare, is there not a cause? Is there not a reason to fight? And the result of his willingness to step into the ring with his powerful presence, they were epic. They were epic. And David said in verse 45, David said to the Philistine, you come to me with a sword and a spear and a javelin. But I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. And this day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you, and I will take your head from you. Glory to God. And this day I will give the carcasses of the camp of the Philistine to the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the earth that all the earth may know that there is still a God in Israel. Hallelujah. Put your hands together and bless him because there is still a God in Israel this morning. Hallelujah. Then all this assembly shall know that the Lord does not save with a sword and spear, for the battle is whose? The battle is whose? The Lord's. 
It's his battle. And he will give you into our hands. And so it was when the Philistine arose and came and drew near to meet David, that David hurried and ran with the army to meet the Philistine. He was ready for battle. He was fired up. He was pumped and primed. Glory to God, had the word in one hand and the evangel in the other. Verse 49, then David put his hand in his bag, took out a stone, he slung it and struck the Philistine in the forehead, probably the only part of his body that wasn't protected. So the stone sank into his forehead and he fell on his face to the earth. And the enemies of the Lord fell on their face before the Lord. It can still happen in our day, in your life, in your situation. The enemies of the Lord falling on their face before our God. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling of the stone. Struck the Philistine, killed him. But there was no sword in the hand of David. Therefore David ran and stood over the Philistine took his sword, took Goliath's sword and drew it out of his sheath and killed him, cut off his head with it. When the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they fled. The greater, listen, the greater the disturbance, the greater the deliverance. So I ask you, what holy disturbance is driving you? Is there anything in your life that causes you kingdom heartburn, kingdom indigestion. I believe God desires to disturb every one of us, to disturb every one of us, to rattle our world. Because friends, listen, just doing your devotions and just being at church on Sundays that is, that, that is not your entire kingdom purpose. Listen, the major part of ministry should be taking place outside of Sunday, outside of the house. We just come together on Sunday to rejoice and declare, look what the Lord has done. Amen. This is what he did on Monday. And this is what he accomplished on Tuesday. And these, this is what he's working on on Wednesday. And Thursday, my good, we triumphed over mighty, mighty powers of the devil. And Friday, we are rejoicing and we're headed for Sunday. Amen. This morning I want to embed into this message something a little different for us. I have three different holy disturbances that drove kingdom people to kingdom purposes. Three holy disturbances that crafted a kingdom message that I believe is worth hearing. And the first video testimony is from our own Pastor Michael Duwalabi in Veda. I had heard about it, the grapevine, and not till this last week we actually sit down and talk about it. But I want you to hear about it this morning and how it all came about and some of the results that they're already seeing, okay? In the beginning... God created the heavens and earth. He created men, women, and all the animals. In 2010, I had a dream one night of a man was running through a jungle. Someone was chasing after him. He wanted to be saved, but there was no one there to tell him about the love of Christ. He came upon a little box that had a button on it. He pressed the button and it told him about the love of Jesus and led him in the sinner's prayer. I woke up and I knew like immediately that I needed to find out what this little box was. The next day, Michael and I searched the internet to see is there some sort of evangelism tool like this? After not finding anything, we realized that we were supposed to make what is now called the message box. Since 2011, we have produced and shipped more than 1,000 message boxes. We've sent message boxes to Russia, to Mexico, Peru, and Brazil. And even some churches here in Oklahoma City have used them for local outreaches. One church even did a coat drive and put a message box in every single coat that they gave to elementary students. One box can play up to a thousand times. There's over 800 million people in the world that do not know how to read. Handing them a Bible track just won't cut it. The message box is a really fun tool because on a missions trip, missionaries can take them out and give them away 
And as they're giving away, kids just kind of flock to them uh, to get their own. Something that's really incredible about it is a kid will get a message box and he'll run home, take it home, and show it to his family and friends. And so in turn, they're hearing the gospel and the plan of salvation without even having to be at any sort of presentation. The Bible says, For God loved the world so much that he gave his one and only Son, so that everyone who believes in him will not die. But God has opened some incredible doors with the message box. Just this last week, we were able to partner with boxer Manny Pacquiao and his foundation to be able to ship 150 message boxes to the Philippines. Their goal is to be able to send more message boxes every four months. Because Jesus died and rose again, we can have forgiveness and a relationship with him. Our vision for the message box is to be able to provide ministries and missionaries around the world with the equipment that they need to be able to help spread the gospel. We believe that the message box is just one of many different tools that God wants to use to help spread His Word. Here it is, the message box, a simple yet effective evangelism tool. You press the button on the top and you'll hear the story of creation, crucifixion, resurrection, and then it leads you in the sinner's prayer. Dear God, I am sorry for the wrong things I have done. Thank you for sending Jesus to pay the price for my sins. Please come and live in my heart forever. Change me on the inside. Isn't that amazing? It's amazing. He gave me one and I took it home to Miss Vicky. I was like, this is so cool. And I turned it on and it was in Spanish. I was like, I need an interpreter. So I said, can I trade my Spanish version in for an English-speaking message box? And they were so kind. God created the heavens and earth. He created men, women, Where is it at? There it is. To be a part of his go. family. Because of our sin, we are separated from God. And it all began. It all began with a dream. It all began with God stirring the heart and disturbing someone's sleep. Would you, let, would you let God disturb you concerning kingdom matters? Who knows what God will do in and through your, your hands and your heart? Thank you, Michael and Veda, for being obedient, first of all, to the voice of the Lord and being willing to Step outside the box and create a box for the cause of the kingdom. Amen. So the first 25 people that show up at the Welcome Center this morning, we have 25 of these free of charge to you, okay? They're $4 a piece otherwise, but for the first 25 that will go, because we want you to take this and share it. Amen? You can't leave yet. Got to wait till I say go, okay? Okay. Amen. The next video that we have is of a dear friend of ours that just this last Thursday we were in his church. He's the presbyter of one of our sections here in Oklahoma. And he invited his pastors and his surrounding areas to come for a roundtable discussion. And Pastor Michael B. and I went and we, we shared about shepherd leadership and, and his Q&A. And it was a great time together. But as, as we were leaving to go to lunch, Channel 9 had pulled up with their rig and, and was setting up a camera and, and putting a mic on Pastor Chad Broderick that pastors First Assembly in Tecumseh, Oklahoma. And this is his story. Welcome back. The flooding we experienced a few months ago revealed a major need among rescue crews. There is now a new effort to get proper equipment before the next time Mother Nature drops dangerous rainfall. Newsline's Christy Lewis is in Tecumseh with the new details. 
Here at Fire Station 1 in Tecumseh, they have a ladder truck, a pumper, and they even have a brush truck. But they say they're missing one crucial piece of equipment that could save lives. What happened back in June can't be changed, but rescuers are doing everything in their power to keep the tragedy from happening again. When the rain pounded on our state, the Little River overflowed, and 80-year-old Carolyn Agle tried to pass Rugless Road to get into town. Tecumseh Fire Department responded to the emergency, but they couldn't get to her. All we could do is wait and for them to get there. An hour passed before Shawnee fire crews could arrive with their boat, but Carolyn died in her vehicle. It's a very, very big wake-up call. But since that wake-up call, they've made preparing for the next water rescue a top priority. They invested in new head-to-toe gear, helmets, gloves, water shoes, and life jackets. It has all the safety features where it releases quick release. And now local churches are banding together to help them get a rescue boat. We want our community to feel that their fire department is not only well staffed, which it is, but also to be well equipped to be able to handle any natural disaster that may come along. Chad Broderick is the pastor at First Assembly and president of the Tecumseh Ministerial Alliance. They have created this GoFundMe account hoping the community will help cover the $15,000 cost of this new inflatable motorized boat. All of us have a heart for our community and we want to do something to make a difference. Their donations that would fund a life-saving tool to carry crews through the current to rescue those in need. And if you want more information, we have posted the link Link to the GoFundMe page for the rescue boat on this story on News9.com. In Tecumseh, Christy Lewis, News9. Amen. Pastor Chad Broderick, <clears throat> investing with him, he, he knew this 80-year-old woman from, from his town, his hometown. A great lady. A lady that tried to get through this swollen river and the truck was turned on its side. She was trapped in a seatbelt. Did not die from drowning, but drowned from suffocation as the seatbelt locked and, and literally suffocated her. And the teams, the rescue teams on the bank of that river could, could do nothing but watch because they did not have the proper tools to rescue her. Chad said to me, That's, that was just unacceptable. There's some things in life, friends, that we need to come to grips with that are absolutely unacceptable that are unacceptable and that we rise up and we volunteer and we raise our hand and we open our heart and we say, God, somehow, some way, if you can make a difference in and through my life, Lord, help us to make this different for the cause of your kingdom and for the cause of those that are hurting and suffering. The third and the last video that I, I want you to see is it's a little more involved, but we have some dear friends that live in the Dallas area, and um, they've grown up with us. They've, they've been some of our, our best buddies through the years, and, and they have a son and a daughter-in-law that as well live in the Dallas, Frisco area, and God's began to do some powerful things in their kids' lives, and they have really stepped to the plate, and it, it's really out of their comfort zone it's way out of my comfort zone, but God is just opening doors of opportunity. See, it's amazing what God will do if we're willing to make a step in his direction. The reason why we never see many miracles is because we're not willing to crawl out on the limb where we need a miracle. We hug the tree, and God said, no, I want you to crawl out on the limb. So the only salvation you have is not in your own power or your own ability or ingenuity, but it's in me, that I'm your safety net. I'm your safety net. And so this is something that God has initiated in, in her heart. Her name is Alicia Bush. And um, um, we kick off with a, a news broadcast of um, an expo that was taking place in Dallas and then their participation in it. So watch this. Well, it's adults only this weekend at the K. Bailey Hutchison uh, Convention Center in Dallas, and uh, what's inside might leave uh, some of you 50 shades of embarrassed. But, well, the Exotica Expo is drawing in a unique Christian group. News 8's Marisa Vader tonight, live at the convention center where a church is not shying away from the adult topic of sex. Marie? 
They're not, John, but you know, we're used to seeing religious folks who might oppose events like this coming out and protesting, but there's a larger group of spiritual people who thought that they have better luck on the convention hall floor. Inside Exotica is audio and visual overload. Some know what or who they've come to see, but others are just looking around. I was just curious. I got invited by a friend, and you know, I'm just open to, I guess, the whole aspect of it. And the expo's goal is exactly what you'd expect. Sex and love and kind of be able to celebrate it versus tuck it, you know, in some dark, deep, dark place. There you go, man. But a bit farther back on the floor, you'll find what could be the most surprising booth. It belongs to Triple X Church. We want Christians having sex. We just don't happen to film it. it sounds like fun. Carl Thomas does outreach for this online house of Christian worship and its biggest ministry, sexuality. Jesus loves you. Here's free stuff. That's about it. The slogan and t-shirts draw people in as Thomas and his team teach that a vibrant sex life and the Lord can exist together. The church also provides resources for sex and pornography addiction. You know, I'm at the show, I'm realizing that my fascination with pornography is not really a healthy one. I need some help. And then, yeah, sure, I'll, I'll tell you what we offer and where to go and all that good stuff. That message of help is something Exotica's organizers are happy to host. The same open dialogue that they have about religion is the same open dialogue we have about sex. And that's how some may find Jesus in between the boots and the beats at Exotica. Triple X Church actually has such a good relationship with Exotica, they are now an official sponsor. The event runs through Sunday. In Dallas, Marisa Vedra, Channel 8 News. Um, it really is an honor to be able to share with you what the Lord is doing in an industry that has been looked down upon by so many. Over the past few years, I've really tried to implement into my life uh, the two greatest commandments, love God and love people, and really trying to love people right where they are. And a few weeks ago, I had the privilege of serving at the adult porn industry convention in Dallas with triplexchurch.com. A few months ago, I heard Pastor Craig Gross give his message at my local church in Frisco about the challenges in the porn industry. And I really began to feel the Lord stirring my heart um, for this ministry and um, all that would attend um, this convention. 20 volunteers um, went and we served at this convention. We went without judgment. We didn't use words like anti-porn, but we definitely shared that we're not for porn. But we really weren't there to preach to them or drive the conversation into um, some sort of ministry, um, theological conversation. We were there simply to tell them that Jesus loves them, hand them a free t-shirt, and hand them a Bible. And one of the really the most compelling uh, conversation that I had with a young lady. She walked by our booth and she had a lot of paparazzi, if you will, around her signing pic autographs and, and taking photos with her. And she came by our booth and said hello. We handed her a water uh, and a snack bar. And um, she started to tell me about her passion for being an Alabama fan. And I shared my love for the Cowboys, of course. And as she was about to walk away, I stuck out my hand and I said, what's your name? And she stuck out her hand and she began to give me her stage name and I could tell that she paused and she looked at me in my eyes and I looked at hers and I saw her for who she really was and she saw my heart and my intention for being there and she said, Veronica. And I knew that that wasn't her stage name. I knew that that was the name that her mother had given her. And right then, I just knew the impact of what we were doing here at a convention where all would seem so lost in that small little moment. I knew that I had planted a seed and there was a mom and there was a grandmother out there who loved her like God loved her. And, um, and that's really what love God, love people and love authentically and love people right where they are means to me. Thank you. 
So where do you hang a light bulb? But in a dark place, and, and where do you set up a triage? But in a place of trauma. And I'm afraid that through the years that we have wrapped our religious robes around us and we have cocooned ourselves to protect the integrity, perhaps, of our lives from the darkness and from the pain and from the sin. And yet it's interesting to me when you read about Jesus, when you read about the life of Jesus, that he felt more comfortable with the sinner, the rank and file, than he did the Pharisees, the religious leaders of that day. It would have been the religious leaders of that day that would have confronted and picketed against this porn expo. But you know what? I believe if, if that would have been in Jesus' day as we see it today, I, I believe that he would have probably rented a booth in the hall with arms outstretched, not condemning, but loving and forgiving. So I just want the Holy Spirit to challenge us some, somehow, some way through, through this process, through this series of, as far as being the message that, you know, it's wonderful to encourage one another. We need to support one another as the body of Christ. But friends, it is time, it is time that we take the message outside the house. And we find a place where God wants to plan us and use us. And I believe that every one of us can have a very unique kingdom message based on the direction of God concerning the steps that we should walk. So I'm just asking the Lord in my own life to, to do something, to stir something. And the truth of the matter is, when I began to get into this material and, and God began to direct me and, and, and challenge my own life, I want, you know, I, I'm just like most of you. I, I don't like being disturbed. I don't like my meals being disturbed. I don't like my activities being disturbed. I don't, I especially don't like my sleep being disturbed. disturbed. So if you're going to call me, call me before 10 None of, us, none of us like to be disturbed because it messes up the whole rhythm of our life because we are agenda-driven and we have it all scheduled out. And yet, where does God fit in the schedule? Where does he fit in the agenda of our lives? There's just too much at stake in light of eternity for us to choose to ignore the pain and yet the possibilities that surround us. We could not hold the people in multiple services on a Sunday morning if we were just willing to allow God to disturb us, to disturb us to the point that it moves us to action. It drives us to action. Amen? So I'm not asking for you, for you to go sign up at the Triple X Church, you know, and be involved, you know, in a, in a porn expo. That's, that's not my intent this morning. If God lays it on your heart, I'm for you and with you. But will you at least be willing to consider the possibilities of what God wants to do and what God can do in and through your life, where you're at, the gifts that you have. It's so interesting to me that Mother Teresa became a mother not because she had a history of pain or poverty. That's not what drove her to sell herself to the cause of the poor in the city of Calcutta in India. It was the fact that she responded. She was willing to respond to kingdom compassion that was birthed in her heart by reason of the need 
that she saw and felt and experienced. And all I'm asking from you is just allow God to stir some deep feelings in your spirit, not to shut them down, not to walk away, not to bury your head in the sand, but to say, God, there's a day coming that I will stand before you. And what have I really done to make a difference? Has my life really counted for the cause of the kingdom? Have I really said thank you for the nail scars in your hands and in your feet for the life that I've lived? Amen. I'm just asking God. I just want you to know. I just want you to know, church, I'm asking God to disturb Bethesda with a holy disturbance that will shake us from our lethargy, awake us from our apathy, and move us beyond our comfort zone to the point that we cry out to God, God, we are so far out on the limb that if you don't show up, somebody's going to die today. Because this is not just a game. This is eternity that we're talking about. It's a kingdom that has no end. And we must roll up our sleeves and declare, God, count me, and I am all in. I'm all in. I close with this statement that I've made many times, but what was it that made the Good Samaritan good? What was it that made this Good Samaritan good? I believe the reason why was because he was willing to roll up his sleeves and get his hands bloody in another man's need. That's ministry, guys. That's ministry. It's not what we do on Sunday. It's what we do on Monday that really counts. Are you listening? Amen. It's blood stain on our hands. Come on. It's our willingness to invest ourselves in a situation that without God's help, it's going south quick. But friends, how many, how many would be grateful and thankful if someone threw you a life jacket If you were going down for the third time, but there was somebody that didn't give up, was willing to stay in the boat to declare, I am your hope. I am your rescue. God, challenge and stir us this morning. Would you stand to your feet today and bow your heads? Father, in the name of Jesus, I commit this word in the hearts of your people. (laughs) God, stir us. God, disturb us. May there be a holy disturbance, God, that captivates our heart, mind, and emotions, that moves us beyond our comfort zone, that moves us into into a place of ministry, oh God. God, set us up. God, set us up, Lord. Order our steps, and may may those steps lead us right into hell, that we may be the answer, that we may decorate declare that Jesus Christ is still King and that He is the Redeemer and the Healer of all mankind. God, in Jesus' name, help us to make a difference, a kingdom difference in the world in which we live. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, yes, God. Hallelujah. God, bring a holy disturbance to Bethesda. God, shake us from our moorings. God, challenge us to to step out into the deep, oh God, to allow you to do what only you can do, and that's prepare us for ministry, oh Lord. Praise God in Jesus' name.